Eight years ago, I confessed to Hunter. He said to me, you've mistaken companionship for love. Eight years later, with someone else by my side, he asks me, give me a chance. Let's give it a try, okay? Ten days after breaking up with Brandon, after eight years, I once again encountered Hunter. It was early winter in Ping City, pouring rain outside. I attended a friend's engagement banquet in the hotel ballroom. Stumbling into the lobby, I pushed away the driver who wanted to assist me, claiming that the hotel's fragrance gave me a headache and I needed some fresh air. Having helped my friend with too much alcohol, I had breathed in the cold air from outside, and at the moment I saw Hunter, I thought I was genuinely drunk. Hunter walked up to me, holding an umbrella. Even from half a meter away, my keen senses could capture Hunter's unique scent in the damp air. I dared not breathe, not even blink, feeling as if Hunter was a mirage appearing after I had too much to drink. But when he called my name, I was like a trapped animal, limbs frozen, unable to move. Riley. I tried to make my breathing sound normal, paused for a moment, and then managed to speak in a casual tone, what a coincidence, running into you here. Are you back on a business trip? Time seemed to favor Hunter exceptionally, he hadn't gained weight or turned into a middle-aged man but remained as handsome as I vaguely remembered. Eight years had only added beauty to his appearance. He looked more mature, stable, and reliable than before. He didn't deny my question about a business trip, instead asking, have you had a lot to drink? I can take you home. I had indeed consumed a lot of alcohol. The alcohol had given me a slight headache and upset stomach, but my thoughts had become surprisingly clear the moment I saw Hunter. I shook my head, flashed a perfectly timed smile, took a step back without drawing attention, avoiding his hand trying to support me. No need, my driver is waiting for me at home. Hunter's movements froze for a moment, his hand hanging in the air, then he withdrew it, looking at me for a while. Before I got into the car, he asked me, can you remove me from your blacklist? I didn't expect him to say that, hesitated for a moment, and said, you're not on my blacklist. After saying that, I opened the phone app to show him the empty blacklist interface. His gaze lingered on my phone screen, his eyes revealing emotions I couldn't understand. He murmured, didn't see your moments, thought you blocked me. I shook my head, saying it couldn't be, and added that I probably forgot to put him in the right group during grouping. Before closing the car door, I heard Hunter say, I'll take you out for dinner in a couple of days. Is that okay? He asked. I forced a smile, nodded, said it was okay, bid him farewell, and let the driver depart. In the rain, the rearview mirror gradually obscured Hunter's figure. It dawned on me that there were deep imprints on my palm, reminding me belatedly that this was not a dream. Of course, I would interact with Hunter politely. After all, we weren't enemies or former lovers with emotional disputes, we were just ordinary old acquaintances. As the car returned home, my mother was still sitting on the sofa watching a TV series. Seeing me back, she grabbed me for a chat, Hunter came this afternoon. I was stunned for a moment. She pointed to several gift boxes on the coffee table and said, Hunter, the one who used to live next door to us. He has become more stable after a few years. I subconsciously looked through the floor-to-ceiling windows to the neighboring building, but the lights there remained off as usual, indicating no one lived there. My mom asked, you didn't know he came back? Don't you guys keep in touch? I shook my head, saying no. She whispered, I remember you two were pretty close when you were kids. Holding onto the staircase railing, I slowly climbed upstairs. Hearing her words, I lowered my gaze and said, that was just a childhood thing. Hunter's family moved next door to us in the summer when I was 12. He was around the same age as my brother. My brother was outgoing and playful, always surrounded by friends. Hunter, on the other hand, had a good personality, and their pure and simple teenage friendship quickly formed. Over time, their relationship naturally became close. Since Hunter's parents were busy working, he became a frequent guest in our home. Occasionally, I would run to the high school section to find my brother. Once, in a daze, I walked to the wrong floor and ended up at the entrance of Hunter's classroom. Hunter and his classmates were holding basketballs and ran into me in the corridor. He stopped me with a gentle voice, what are you doing here? I glanced at the stairwell sign, suddenly realizing my mistake, and said that I went to the wrong place. One of the basketball team members asked him, Hunter, who's this little kid? Hunter smiled, tousled my hair with his hand, and said, she's my sister. In the following two years, I would sit by the basketball court, holding two bottles of water, pointing at the figures on the court and saying, that's my brother, oh, and that's also my brother. My sense of aesthetics was probably shaped by my brother and Hunter's influence. 
I vaguely understood why they were popular. They always dressed well in simple school uniforms, shining brightly under the sun on the basketball court, smiling generously during leisurely chats, and sitting by the window reading quietly. These boys, who appeared with a virtual halo, carried the memories of a vibrant and colorful youth, becoming synonymous with the untimely end of adolescence in the dull and dark student era for others. I also liked Hunter's appearance, much like liking a set of Lego, a ship, or a scenic spot, pure and simple. Being popular in school, even I received chocolate cookies from beautiful sisters. The pretty sisters would gather around me, discussing the preferences of my two brothers. Usually, in these situations, my real brother would casually appear and say, Riley, stop snacking. You won't have an appetite for dinner at home. Be careful not to stunt your growth. Meanwhile, Hunter would pull me out of the crowd, politely saying to people, don't feed her anymore, she exceeded her sweets intake today. Let's go, Riley, it's time to go home. In my memory, Hunter had been meticulous and considerate since his teenage years, and he had a reliable personality. For a long time, I always felt that Hunter was more like a real brother than my biological brother. Many of my actions and skills were taught by Hunter. Whenever I faced difficulties, the first person I thought of was Hunter. I learned surfing with him, paddling with boards, and rock climbing with both hands and feet. In times of trouble, he explained geometry models to me and taught me how to solve physics problems step by step. One year, we went to climb a snowy mountain. When coming down, I was frightened by the steep slope and hesitated to move forward. Standing a meter or two away from me, he said, don't be afraid, I'll catch you. At most, I'll cushion your fall. After hesitating for a long time, I finally took a step, and as expected, I stepped on empty space, but Hunter caught me. He used a lot of strength to prevent both of us from falling, holding my hand and smiling, see, didn't fall. Hunter seemed like my doryman, always able to solve my problems. The question I asked him the most was, Hunter, what should I do? In physics, there is a law of inertia, and I think my dependence on Hunter was a kind of inertia. However, inertia can be harmful, but the young me never realized that. Hunter's invitation to dinner wasn't just a polite gesture. The next day, he appeared downstairs at my studio, asking what I wanted to eat. He handed me a bag of candied chestnuts, saying he saw them on the way and thought of me. I didn't tell him that I had quit sweets, I just placed the candied chestnuts aside without peeling a single one. I felt more accomplished than when I was younger. At least, I could still chat comfortably with him at the dinner table, as if we were old friends reuniting after a long time, simply having dinner together. After dinner, he said he would drive me home but was declined by me, I drove here. Unexpectedly, he nodded and said, that's fine. How about you drive me back then? In fact, with Hunter, I could hardly say no to anything. Even the inertial factors in my body were triggered, recalling the deliberately forgotten details clearly. The night in Ping City was still lively, and the main road was bustling even after dark. The car blended into the continuous flow of the street. Hunter turned his head and suddenly said, your driving skills are pretty good now. It's all right. I couldn't help but remember the first time I drove after getting my driver's license when Hunter sat in the passenger seat. That day, he sat in the front seat and watched me start the car slowly. I wasn't very brave, and even on a wide road, I only dared to drive at 20 kilometers per hour. I was even overtaken by a cyclist on the side. Hunter didn't show impatience, he told me not to be afraid, saying he had his hand on the handbrake and could brake for me at any time. But until he left, I still hadn't truly learned to drive. These years, has anyone taught you? Hunter asked as I skillfully passed several cars. I shook my head, saying casually, no. Actually, many things, you just learn as you go. Take my photography work, for example. I drive out every year for location scouting, practice makes perfect. Since getting stranded in Iceland a few years ago, I even know how to fix a car now. Looking through the rearview mirror, I saw him lightly furrow his brows and asked, Stranded? Wasn't Brandon with you? The car stopped below the hotel apartment where Hunter stayed. I turned to look at him and said softly, Back then, I wasn't with Brandon. Hunter paused and asked, How did you get stranded? I shifted my gaze away and narrated slowly, It was a winter a few years ago. I went for a photo shoot alone, lacking wilderness experience. I thought it would be fine as long as I had spiked tires, but my driving skills were still poor. The car slipped on the icy surface, and I got stranded. Coincidentally, there was no one around for miles, and there was no signal. With the car running low on fuel, I almost thought I would freeze to death under the glacier. His voice was a bit hoarse, and then? 
Fortunately, after waiting for two or three hours, a passing car came by. The owner helped me pull the car up from the ice and assisted me in making a roadside rescue call. I spoke cheerfully, after that journey, I immediately enrolled in a car repair course for myself. Now, I can lift a jack as skillfully as anyone else. Probably even more proficient than all of you. However, Hunter didn't find it amusing and remained silent. I laughed and lowered my gaze, saying, so, whether or not Brandon was there doesn't matter. You see, even without others, I can solve these problems on my own. Although I mentioned Brandon, the words were actually directed at Hunter. I felt that Hunter was a scar in my heart. It had scabbed over, and everyone thought it was healed, but when he reappeared in front of me, a light touch reminded me that the wound inside was still fresh, not fully healed, deliberately ignored all this time. You see, without you, what does it matter? In the days without you, I've learned various skills. In situations you don't know about, I can solve all the tricky problems by myself. Anyone can live without someone else, and no one is indispensable. Uncovering the wound in front of Hunter made me ache unbearably, but I still had to forcefully lay it out for him to see. Thus, I eventually made the atmosphere awkwardly cold and said, you've reached the hotel. Good night. I forgot when I truly learned the definition of liking, but I can be sure that I experienced the feeling of heartbeat with Hunter. For a period, our home got a home theater system. Coincidentally, my brother loved watching horror movies and often invited friends over for movie nights. Despite being scared and inexperienced, I always tagged along. A group of us gathered in the home theater room, turning off the lights to watch movies like The Village of Corpse and Juan, The Grudge. No matter how many times we watched them, I would still hide in a pile of cushions, trembling, especially when Sadako appeared. My brother heartlessly teased me, Riley, watching you is more interesting than watching horror movies. Hunter was much more refined than my brother. He not only refrained from mocking me but also sat with me in the corner of the theater room. Whenever there was a scary scene, he would raise his hand to cover my eyes. He said, it's okay, don't be afraid. By that time, he was already tall, with well-defined finger joints and warm, spacious palms, making people feel reassured. I held onto his hand, curled up next to him. Peeking through his fingers, I felt less scared, enveloped in his clean scent. In the winter of my 16th year, due to the strong La Nina climate, Ping City experienced an early drop in temperature, with heavy snowfall in early winter. However, during this snow season, I underwent a minor surgery during the winter vacation, leading to my parents confining me at home for recuperation. My family members always indulged me, but when it came to health issues, they didn't budge an inch. They were afraid I would catch a cold if I went out, let alone go to the snowfield. They didn't even allow me to step out of the house. Every day, they kept me indoors, drinking bowl after bowl of nourishing soups in the heated room. Holding brochures of snow-covered Christmas towns on my phone, I gestured and compared them with my family, whining and rolling on the bed, expressing how much I wanted to go to the Christmas snow town. I even promised to wear many layers of clothing. However, I didn't get the freedom to leave. Even my family members were afraid that I would sneak out onto the balcony to play in the snow, so they added a lock to the balcony door in my room. I looked pitifully at Hunter, an honorary member of my family, hoping he would join me in rebellion. To my surprise, he nodded solemnly, showing his approval. The group of people wished to encase me in a glass cover and keep me in a greenhouse. On Christmas Eve, I lay on my bed in the dark, bored, holding my phone, sighing while looking at pictures of Christmas activities in the snow town. Suddenly, someone knocked on the balcony glass. I was startled, thinking it was an auditory hallucination, but the knocking on the glass didn't stop. I turned on the dim light on the balcony, pulled back the curtains, and saw Hunter standing outside. I think the expression on my face at that moment could only be described as dumbfounded. I opened my mouth and the first thing I asked him was, how did you get here? But I quickly realized that the sound insulation of the balcony glass was too good, and Hunter couldn't hear me at all. He smiled, raised his phone, and signaled me to answer it. Come over, I have a Christmas gift for you, his voice came through the phone. How did you get up here? The only passage to the balcony was through my room, and it was still locked. I climbed over from my place, he pointed, indicating that his study balcony was very close to my room. He had sneaked over from there, with traces of gray-white marks and melting snow still on his assault jacket. Why climb over for a gift? I asked through the glass door while staring at him. Hunter smiled, took a step to the side, revealing the small table on the balcony that he had blocked from my view. On the table was a snowman about half an arm's height, with a small Christmas hat on its head. 
The orange porch light cast a faint light on the snowman, and Hunter's voice was low, saying, Riley, Merry Christmas. Don't be upset because you can't go out to play. The snowfall wasn't heavy, resembling countless cotton flakes falling. Hunter, standing outside under the dim light, looked like a dreamlike envoy. His well-defined face appeared softer in the light, blending the stability of a young man with the sunshine of a youth, and there was a rich smile in his eyes. As my fingertips touched the balcony glass, feeling the cold temperature spreading from my fingertips to my elbow, slowly turning warm, it was as if the overflowing feeling of liking in my heart said, I'm not upset. I really like it. Hunter and I chatted casually on the phone for a while. Finally, he climbed over the balcony railing and returned to his home. Climbing trees and walls, such undignified actions, were not something Hunter would normally do. But when he performed these actions, even his posture seemed graceful. His figure disappeared from the balcony, leaving me standing alone in a daze. After a while, he called me again, saying, take care of your health. There are many more winters to come. I looked at the snowman outside, bathed in the dim light, and softly responded with a hmm. At 16, that Christmas, the 20-year-old hunter easily took the lead in all the encounters and heartbeats in my life. I once thought that I would definitely be with Hunter. During my high school years, on Valentine's Day, Hunter came to pick me up after class. When he entered the classroom through the back door, my desk was filled with various gifts. Hunter patted my shoulder from behind, pretending to be casual, so many chocolates. I turned around to look at him, smiling, it's not as much as you used to receive. In a somewhat parental tone, he expressed his displeasure, you accepted them just because they were given to you? Growing up, why are you still so fond of sweets? It's so easy for people to buy you. I put on a distressed look, why are you angry? They just put them on my desk. I can't throw them away. Hunter casually flipped through them, confiscating all the love letters hidden in the chocolates. Like giving me an order, he advised, then distribute them to your classmates. He helped me distribute the sweets, but I stopped him. From the gifts on my desk, I took out a box of cookies and said, this box doesn't count. His expression became more serious instantly. Standing in front of me, he asked from a higher position, why doesn't this box count? He continued questioning, who gave this, and how old are you to be in a relationship? I unpacked the cookie packaging, nonchalantly took a bite, and then said, I bought this myself. Do you want some? His expression softened a bit, reluctantly took a cookie, and lectured me about not dating too early. I looked up at him, then, big brother, at what age can I start dating? Hunter wiped the cookie crumbs off my face with a napkin, gently, and took away the box of cookies in my arms, saying, when you grow up a bit more. Later, when I grew up a bit more, I got admitted to the same school as him. On the Christmas of my 18th year, we agreed to go to Sapporo together to see the snow lanterns I had always wanted to see. He, as usual, said, okay, his voice consistently gentle, I'll go see whatever you like. But later, we didn't make it to Sapporo during the snowy season. The day before departure, Hunter told me that he had to cancel, couldn't accompany me on the trip. He provided no unnecessary explanations, standing under the street lamp, his tone somewhat subdued, apologizing to me. At that moment, I understandingly said it was okay. I naturally took his hand and said, anyway, there's something to see every year. That year, there was no snowfall in Ping City. However, I made the most mistaken decision of my life. Suddenly, with a heated mind, I tiptoed and kissed Hunter's cheek, saying, it's okay, I like you so much. We can go next year. Hunter froze, as if he had been stiff for half a minute. Slowly, he withdrew his hand from my embrace. He looked at me for a long time, emotions swirling in his eyes. After considering how to speak, he finally avoided my gaze and said, Riley, I really like you, like your friends and brothers like you, not the kind of like between a man and a woman. You're still young, mistaking companionship and family affection for love. He mentioned that he was about to study abroad soon. Perhaps, after some time, as I interacted with new classmates and friends, I would realize that our affection was not that of a romantic nature. That was the last time I saw Hunter. In the following eight years, we never exchanged a single text message. My liking for Hunter was like a fever, creating illusions and experiencing pain. So, after recovering from the illness, memories related to Hunter were forcibly sealed in a corner of my mind. If I didn't deliberately think about it, I would occasionally forget the existence of this person. Hunter began to appear frequently near my studio. At first, the occurrences could be explained by coincidence, but as the frequency increased, it seemed more deliberate. 
Without knowing how many times we had meals together, he casually mentioned, well, the branch office is conveniently located nearby. I kept my head down while eating, not delving into the truth of his words, nor did I stop him from bringing afternoon tea to our studio. Towards the end of the year, when I was busy with an important charity exhibition and auction, I was almost overwhelmed. Even if I didn't deliberately avoid Hunter, we met much less frequently. Near the end of the exhibition, Brandon appeared. We hadn't seen each other for over two months. This time, he hopped over to me with a cane, looking quite amusing. Rumors had been circulating outside, saying that after Brandon and I broke up, Brandon's father was furious, deeply resenting the scoundrel his family had produced. Consequently, he disciplined Brandon severely, landing him in the hospital for almost half a month. Brandon seemed to be apologizing to me, sincerely spending a considerable sum to purchase two of my artworks. He also obsequiously asked if I wanted to grab a late-night snack together. When he asked me this question, I turned my head and saw Hunter standing a few meters away from me. Without saying a word, Hunter walked over, stood very close to me, breaking the safe social distance. It felt as intimate as in our childhood, his arm gently around me, palm gripping my forearm, asking, is work over? Let me take you home. His expression showed no displeasure, but there was an inexplicable low pressure in his aura. However, his tone was somewhat stiff, as if insisting that I must choose between the two. Brandon had lived in the same neighborhood as us since childhood and was also a childhood friend. Naturally, he recognized both Hunter and me. His gaze shifted between Hunter and me, fluttering with puppy-like affection as he looked at me. I sighed lightly and said goodbye to Brandon, ultimately getting into the car with Hunter. It started snowing lightly in Ping City. The car's radio was left off. After driving for about 10 minutes, Hunter suddenly asked, How did you get together with Brandon? Why are you asking this all of a sudden? He said, I want to know. Looking at the light snowfall ahead, I spoke slowly, getting lost in some memories. One night, I had acute appendicitis, called 120 to go to the hospital by myself. I didn't tell my family because I was afraid they would worry. But at that time, lying in the hospital undergoing surgery in the early morning, I felt that I needed someone to accompany me, and Brandon happened to be there. Hunter tightened his grip on the steering wheel. The veins on the back of his hand were prominent, but his tone remained calm, then why did you break up? I smiled. This question was too simple, I had repeated it a thousand times to others, if it doesn't work out, we break up. There's not always a need for many reasons. Then why did you get drunk for him? I paused for a moment, suddenly understanding that he had misunderstood something. I wanted to explain that on the day we reunited, I was just blocking drinks for someone else. However, the words were stuck in my throat. After a long silence, I finally said, well, it doesn't matter. Difficulties will pass, illnesses will pass, the pain of breaking up will pass, and the feeling of liking someone will also pass. There's nothing that can't be overcome. The car stopped in front of my apartment building. I got out of the car, ready to go upstairs. Hunter also got out of the car, casually walking behind me, as if he was going to accompany me. I stood in front of the elevator and said, Hunter, what you said back then was right. As long as people keep moving forward and looking ahead, they won't care about the scenery they've left behind. I hinted at something, so, Hunter, just stop here. After saying that, I went upstairs without daring to look at Hunter's expression. The room was dimly lit, and I stood by the balcony looking down. Hunter's car was still parked downstairs. Without paying much attention, I turned on the lights, checked tomorrow's flight schedule, and began packing. After roughly 20 minutes of packing, I couldn't resist the urge to know if Hunter had left. I walked to the balcony, where the temperature was below freezing. The black car remained stationary, covered with a thin layer of white. I waited for a while, but Hunter didn't appear. I couldn't understand why he was lingering downstairs, and suddenly, I felt angry. Without even putting on my coat, I went downstairs. As soon as I stepped out of the lobby with heating, I saw him leaning against the wall, back facing me, smoking and coughing twice. Hunter, I called him. Hearing my voice, he quickly extinguished the cigarette, displaying a skilled move. Why are you coming downstairs dressed so lightly? It's cold outside. He smelled of smoke, and even after putting out the cigarette, the scent lingered. I noticed that he was still wearing the thin outfit he had on when he got out of the car. He seemed ready to take off his remaining coat and give it to me. I wanted to ask, don't you feel cold? Don't you wear more, but refrained? Since reuniting with Hunter, frequent meetings every two or three days made me feel as if we had never been apart. 
So, there hadn't been a moment until now when I vividly realized that we had been separated for eight years. In those eight years, he had never seen me in sickness, confusion, winning awards, or pride. He didn't know why I had become as discreet as he was in my speech. Just as I had never seen him succeed, be steady, fail, or be lonely, I didn't know when he learned to smoke. Time that was missed was missed, and lack of intersection was just that. We lost our understanding, couldn't fathom each other's thoughts, and had to carefully ponder every word before saying it. I asked him, what are you doing here? He looked at me deeply, as if making a decision, and then said, I want to be with you, want to be closer to you, and am thinking about how to pursue you. I was stunned for a moment, and the words blurted out, is standing downstairs freezing the method? After saying that, we both fell into silence. Perhaps being outside for too long, he coughed twice again. But the self-sacrifice strategy was useless to me. I shook my hand and was about to go back to the apartment. After walking a few steps, I turned back and saw him standing still. I asked him patiently, why are you still standing there? Are you planning to freeze to death here? He understood the implied meaning of my words and immediately followed me. In the elevator, he suddenly said, does freezing help? Can I wait for you here? The cautious and probing tone from his mouth made my eyes suddenly sore and painful. My complexion wasn't good, and I sneered, if freezing helps, the people pursuing me would all be downstairs as ice sculptures. According to what you said, I might as well install a time clock at my doorstep, and every day, the person with the highest score can be selected. But he seemed to take it seriously and asked, really? After saying that, he took his own phone and searched. He asked me, do you want to buy a fingerprint time clock or a face recognition one? I snatched his phone and saw that he was on a shopping apps order page. I was furious and asked him, are you sick? He fell silent again. The heating in the room warmed my blood. Hunter looked at the clothes scattered on the floor and asked me, where are you going? I irritably stuffed my things into the suitcase, I'm going to Sapporo tomorrow to participate in the Snow Lantern Festival and take photos. As soon as I said that, I regretted it because the journey we hadn't completed before was to go see the Snow Lanterns. Then I heard Hunter ask, can I go with you? Riley, give me a chance. Let's try this, okay? Until the plane landed at the airport, I felt somewhat surreal. During the flight, I dozed off, and a familiar presence enveloped me. When I woke up, I found myself leaning on Hunter's shoulder, and he had his arm around me, like an intimately close couple. In the first few days of arriving in Sapporo, I attended several exhibitions of friends. While I was busy with work, sitting at the table reviewing the photos taken with my camera throughout the day, Hunter was engrossed in reviewing company documents. His sudden decision, akin to an elopement with me to the ends of the earth, naturally accumulated numerous company affairs. I was well aware that the company couldn't function without him. Over the years, he had expanded the company from Australia to North America. News reports claimed he was a young and ambitious entrepreneur, far from being an idle person. Yet, when we went out, he didn't answer a single work call, always trailed behind me with equipment, held my hand, and draped his arm over my shoulder. I didn't push him away. Simply because this person was Hunter. On the eighth day of our trip to Sapporo, in the evening, I received an important call from an editor asking me to send a set of pictures. I told Hunter, I need to borrow your laptop to send an email. He was still in a conference call, handed me a note with the password, and gestured towards the laptop on the table. I quickly sent the email and, out of habit, logged into a photo-sharing website to upload my new works. However, after entering the website's address, I saw that there was already a default login account and password on the site, with the username Anonymous. Suddenly, I realized something and instantly recalled that in recent years, at the charity auctions held at the end of each year, there was always an anonymous person who bid on my closing pieces. The ultimate goal of the charity banquet was to donate, but this anonymous person never revealed their name. We speculated that maybe it was a guilty businessman using the name Anonymous to persistently bid on works, using charitable donations to compensate for his troubled conscience. But now, I seem to have discovered something wrong with my train of thought because I touched the true face under the mask of this anonymous person. I clicked on login and saw the works that this account had bid on. When I was unknown, many worthless works, and now, the pinnacle pieces at the charity banquets every year. In that moment, my mind went blank, my blood froze, and I stared at the account records with a buzzing sensation in my head. I thought I should have some privacy and moral principles. I shouldn't continue reading, but I couldn't control myself. Unrestrained, I opened the computer folder and went through Hunter's notebook's hidden files. 
In the depths of my mind, I felt that perhaps there would be something about me. His files were as organized as his personality. I almost didn't have to exert much effort to find my photos. Those that I posted on social media deliberately blocking Hunter's face. There were also some group photos with friends, probably ones Hunter saved locally after seeing them from our mutual friends. A woman's sixth sense played out to its fullest at this moment. Not only did I go through his computer files, but I also unraveled them, looking at his browser search history. In the search history of the past three months, I saw the keywords he had entered. How to install an intelligent time clock. Dangers of winter in Iceland. Riley Photography. Charity Exhibition Riley. A few cold search records made it difficult for me to breathe, and I couldn't catch my breath. It turned out that during countless sleepless nights when I entered Hunter and his company's name into search engines, looking for every piece of news about him, Hunter was also searching through web news' snippets, looking for any information about me. Just at this moment, my mom sent a voice message, saying, Riley, Hunter's parents are visiting our home. I heard from Hunter's mom that Hunter's dad has had several major and minor surgeries in recent years. It's quite alarming to hear about it. Riley, don't stay up late all the time. Let me tell you, your health is the only capital for revolution. For once, I didn't casually respond to my mom's message. I was stunned for a moment and sent a text asking, what surgeries? Cardiac surgery. It seemed that some unclear thoughts in the mist had found a lead. I asked, when did he have surgery for the first time? My typing hands were a bit trembling. Mom, ask Hunter's dad, find out more details. It's important to me. After a while, a new message came to my phone. Surgery was seven or eight years ago. Don't worry, Hunter's dad has recovered well now. That night, once again, I browsed through various reports about Hunter. In fact, I had read each news article many times, and all the links were saved in a folder. I opened one after another, revisiting Hunter's rags to riches story. When he took over the company, it was just a mid-range manufacturing enterprise. Under his leadership, the company weathered strikes, endured industry downturns, engaged in price wars with competitors, teetered on the brink of bankruptcy only to revive, and even faced legal disputes with shareholders. Yet, the media adored Hunter, perhaps due to his looks or his exceptional speaking skills. They described him as a leader in the industry, a visionary helmsman. He rapidly expanded market share, led the team through the ups and downs of the business waves, turning a family business into a multinational corporation. Journalists loved to exaggerate achievements. When Hunter achieved fame and stood at the top, they casually glossed over the difficulties on the company's upward journey. But then, I suddenly realized that when he took over the company, faced the pressure of his father's illness, and resisted the eyes of other families eager to take over, he was only 22 years old. How did he manage to tame those old foxes at the age of 22? How did he tirelessly shuttle between the hospital and the company? And with what kind of feelings did he push me away and say, we're not in love? The aftermath of staying up late manifested as swollen eyes the next day. Hunter and the hotel staff got me two ice packs to soothe my eyes, bringing some relief. When we set off for the venue to see the Snow Lantern Festival, Hunter was suggesting dinner options for me. He listed a few restaurant names, and I suddenly interrupted him, asking, why did you buy my artworks? He paused for a moment, realizing what I was talking about, and said, you already know, huh? I nodded, and he said, I wanted to buy them. Then why did you choose to bid anonymously? He forced a smile, but it didn't reach his eyes. It looked more like a wry smile. After hesitating for a while, he instinctively touched his pocket, seemingly wanting to get out of the car and smoke to avoid this question. He remained silent for a long time and finally said, I was afraid that if you knew it was me, you would be upset. Is it important whether I'm upset or not? I asked. He nodded, of course, it's important. As long as you're happy, that's enough for me. He continued with the dinner topic, saying, you always wanted to try the dishes from the chef, right? I booked a table, we can go after watching the lanterns. He was always like this, considering everything thoroughly, always putting my preferences first, wanting to sweep away all obstacles and difficulties in front of me according to his own ideas. What if I'm not happy being with you? I blurted out. You said, let's try. We've tried for a few days, but, Hunter, I feel like we've moved on. Let's just forget it. It seemed like he didn't hear what I said. He looked tense all over, still continuing with the topic, they say there's fresh sea urchin today. You should like it. I repeated, Hunter, I said let's forget it. He fell silent, and for the first time, I saw a sense of confusion on his face. 
After a long time, he said, it's only been a few days. How about we give it another try? I shook my head, looked at his gradually defeated expression, felt the heartache like a knife, and said, no, even if we try again, it will be the same. The time we missed is already gone. He suddenly grabbed my hand, asking, I'll make up for everything I missed. What do you want? Take everything from me. I'll give it all to you. Is that okay? He held my wrist so tightly that it hurt, but the pain in my heart was far worse. I bit my lip and said, what if I don't want to take anything from you? Didn't you say my happiness is the most important? I might be thinking of getting back together with Brandon. His facial expression turned even grayer, and his lips trembled a bit. He remained silent. After the song in the car looped back, I asked him, why aren't you saying anything? Aren't you supposed to be magnanimous? His voice was hoarse as he asked me, do I have the right to say no? After speaking, he raised his hand to touch my face, but I turned my head and avoided it. Don't you dislike it when I touch you, right? His voice sounded somewhat bitter, but he didn't lower his hand. In the end, his fingertips still touched my cheek. Riley, do you actually hate me a lot, really can't stand me? At that time, you were so young, and I didn't want to be with you, so I left you. Is that it? My eyes felt sour, but I forced back the tears. Hunter's words made me feel a dense and throbbing pain. He asked me, is it too late now? Do you really not want to like me anymore, Riley? Have you fallen for someone else? I bit my lip and remained silent. He thought of something, took out his wallet from his pocket, and pulled out something, asking me, is this still useful? It was a favor voucher, still bearing my name, one of the birthday gifts I casually gave him over a decade ago. He continued to take out other cards from his wallet, like the instant no anger card. The writing on the card was still clear, well-preserved but with slightly yellowed edges. My youthful signature, green and simple, became the last straw that overwhelmed me. Anticipating my response of, no use, Hunter pulled me tightly into his arms, holding me as if this could meld our bones and blood, preventing any more separation. After a while, I heard myself saying, Hunter, do you know you're annoying? Why do you still keep these useless things? And then, I miss you so much. Can you stop leaving again? Tears finally fell at this moment. Initially, I sobbed softly, but later on, I couldn't hold back, wailing against Hunter's chest like a helpless child, soaking his sweater entirely. His arm, like a steel cage, trapped me in a narrow space, capturing all of me, my person, my heart, my soul. Yet, there were moist droplets falling near my ear. It was strange, how could my own tears reach this position? When I cried to the point of struggling to breathe, Hunter lowered his head and kissed me. In the blurry aftermath of tears, I saw his eye sockets were as red as mine. Hunter and I parted ways on the eve of the Snow Lantern Festival many years ago. After meandering through life, we unexpectedly held hands again on a winter day in the snowy landscape. Before entering the Omicase restaurant, I asked Hunter, isn't it difficult to make a reservation at this place? He smiled and said, money can make the impossible happen. However, when I saw him entering the restaurant and casually greeting the head chef, I was surprised and asked, have you been here before? He admitted that he had. As we left the restaurant, I noticed a small public telephone booth near the entrance. These streetside conveniences are rare to find in China nowadays. I asked the owner, can that phone be used, or is it just a decoration? While everyone followed my gaze, the owner hadn't answered yet when Hunter suddenly spoke, it can be used. How do you know? I inquired. He seemed to treat it as a trivial matter. Well, one year, I used it to call you. I was taken aback. When? Hunter helped me adjust my scarf. We didn't have an umbrella, and the snow in Sapporo was getting heavier, leaving some snow on Hunter's broad shoulders. I can't remember exactly, probably a few years ago, he said casually. Around the time before the company went public, there was a lot of negative press. One night, while on a business trip, I had dinner here with a partner. I must have been a bit drunk, feeling a strong desire to hear your voice. So, I borrowed two coins from the restaurant owner and called you. I shook my head, searching my memory but finding no record of this incident. Hunter chuckled, saying, of course, you wouldn't remember. When you answered the phone, you said, hello, who's this? I didn't dare to speak, and you said to someone else on the line, it might be a scam call, and then hung up. A dull pain struck my heart, and I couldn't resist asking, why didn't you come back to find me? At first, the company didn't take off. Later? After it went public, why didn't I see you? Hunter explained calmly, at that time, you were already with Brandon, and I didn't want to disturb the peace you had finally found in your life. 
If I hadn't broken up with Brandon, you wouldn't have come back to find me, right? Hunter remained silent, confirming my assumption. Have you never regretted it? I asked, changing my question. He shook his head, earnestly telling me, Riley, even if I could go back and have a chance to make the same choice again, I would still make the same decision. He said he couldn't guarantee his success and didn't want me to take such risks. He believed I should be protected like a fragile item in a glass case, carefully nurtured in a greenhouse. I pushed him hard, asking, Have you ever thought of me, Hunter? Have you ever asked for my thoughts? I was willing to be with you. His gaze was firm as he forcefully embraced me again, saying each word deliberately, but I don't want to. So, you left me, Hunter. Did you think you could fool me with my youthful naivety, unable to distinguish between liking and companionship? Did you ever consider that I'm not foolish? The questions I couldn't figure out at 18, could I still not understand at 20 and 25? How could I not understand? How could I not discern what was familial love and what was romantic love? My liking for Hunter was like a high fever. Even though the fever had subsided, the continuous yearning and heartache persisted like lingering symptoms. I only knew that no one would ever indulge me as he did. No one would gift me a snowman on Christmas Eve. No one would accompany me through all the paths in my long and verdant youth. I didn't need to ask or verify, I could understand Hunter's possessiveness, his insincere words, and how he once liked me. Just like how I liked him. It was a friendship, family bond, and more than that, a romantic affection. Hunter allowed me to shove him but didn't let go. Finally exhausted, I asked him with a hoarse voice, why didn't you take my words to heart, but you kept the things I gave you? He asked, what things? I said, I've always said that Brandon has a gay vibe. Don't you remember at all? This time, it seemed Hunter's brain malfunctioned. You? I looked up at him. So, Hunter, I haven't moved forward as you wished. I've been stuck in the same place, waiting for you. Hunter. Hunter. I had whispered this name countless times in the unknown nights, and each time I thought of him, my whole heart would go through a whirlwind. He hugged me tightly, and I asked him, Don't you think you owe me an apology? He immediately said, I'm sorry, his voice bitter but quick to add, Riley, I won't leave again. I'll take you everywhere from now on. How about that? The snow lanterns in Sapporo flickered on and off. All the glimmers and fragments of the past in the years converged at this moment. The tender feelings that had been carefully concealed in the Christmas snow finally met again in the winter of many years later. I finally had Hunter. Just as Hunter had me.